Good morning. We are glad that you are here today to worship God together. We are welcoming Tiffany and Ian to be with us this day to bring special music, and we're so glad that you are here. And the voice that you hear when you call the office sometimes, the young man's voice, Tony, is here today too, and he is a semina seminary student at Mefesco. And so we decided this might be a good time for him to step in and to do some service leadership. Typically on the first Sunday of the month, we have celebrated Holy Communion. We are not doing that today. Perhaps in the next few weeks, we can get that organized in a way that is safe. But for those of you who would like to have the communion ritual today, invite you to go back to our online services for the first part, the first Sunday of July, and you can go through that part of the service and celebrate Holy Communion. For those of you that have not been here yet in this new setup, we do not sing in this service. We meditate on the words as we listen to Tim sing. And um, we do not respond back aloud with the Lord's Prayer, but we do pray that in our minds and our hearts. Let's worship God together.
The summer and winter and a springtime and a harvest. The sun and moon and the stars in their courses above. And join strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings all mine with ten thousand beside. Great is thy faithfulness. I ask that you rise as you are able for the reading of the gospel. A reading from Luke, chapter 15. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him. And the Pharisees and scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to the fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough to spare But here I am, dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. 
So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put him on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet, and get the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, your brother has come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, listen, for all those years I've been working like a slave for you and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me even a young goat so I may celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours comes back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you kill the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, because this brother of yours was dead and has come back to life. He was lost and has been found. Friends, may these words written long ago bring peace and comfort to you today. Amen. Boys and girls, I do not know if you heard the prelude to our service, that music that happens beforehand. But have mom or dad or grandma or grandpa make sure that you hear the special music today and maybe go back and hear the prelude. We have a harpist here today and a violinist, and they are with us. And if you were here in this place, we would let you see those instruments, for they are wonderful, and we're so glad that they are here to play for us this day. Also... You can ask mom or dad or grandma or grandpa or whoever helps you with the internet, maybe you'll do it yourself, to go on to our Facebook page and to see where our explorations group went yesterday. They went and visited some animals. And you might want to check that out. They had happiness and they had sadness. Happiness because they were there with all the wonderful animals. And sadness because one of the big cows that some of them have got to know over the years, named Wesley, had died. But even in their sadness, they had a wonderful time with the other animals, learning about God's creation and about sharing together and helping animals that were in great need. So boys and girls, these are a couple of things I'd like you to check out today. And now let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for the boys and girls of this congregation, for the boys and girls of the world. We thank you for music, music that we have each week in this place that moves us. And we thank you for the animals that Explorations visited. We give you thanks, O God, for Jesus also. Amen. Please join me in meditation and prayer. Holy and gracious God, you are the one of prodigal grace. We give you thanks for the gift of life and for the blessings of this life, for friends and family and love that is abundant. Lord, we find ourselves in suffering and sorrow and moving through challenges and struggles that feel overwhelming, that feel tiring, despairing, and bleak. 
We ask that you lead us through these trials and back to your grace that is abundant. Be with us as we weep, as we lay through sleepless nights, and comfort us with the peace that is abundant. Fill us with hope, sustain us in your mercy. Uphold patience and stamina by your Holy Spirit and your prodigal grace. Transform our lives to wholeness. Take the pieces of us that feel broken and pointless and create them anew with meaning and beauty. And in wholeness, may we be the hands and heart of Christ. Through these many things, Lord, may we remember in our meditative hearts the words that your Son Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Please pray with me. Amen. Father Michael Marsh shared the story of Bob. Bob was a gentleman who was probably in his 70s. And he was present as Michael was teaching the story of the prodigal son. He sat attentively and quietly. When the priest finished speaking, Bob was the first one out of his chair. He was upset as he made his way to the front of the classroom. What about the bath? he demanded. You didn't say anything about the bath. Father Michael had no idea what Bob was talking about and told him that he did not understand Bob's comment. Bob became more agitated the longer he talked. You know where he'd been. What about the bath? Yes, the priest said. He was in the pig pen. And you know what he would have smelled like and what was on him, Bob said. Pig poop, the priest said kiddingly. Bob did not think it was funny. Then he went on to explain. The son was dirty and smelly. The father would never hug him, kiss him, or put a robe on him until the son first had a bath. Why didn't you talk about the bath? Father Michael explained that a bath was not part of the story, that we can never get clean enough to go home. Instead, we go home to get clean. The father receives the son as he is. He hugs him, kisses him, robes him, all without a bath. The son is immersed in love. Bob just could not believe that. So together they read the story again. When they got to the end of the story, Bob's eyes filled with tears, and he said, All my life, I thought the story said the son had to take a bath before he could go home. And the priest said to him, And all your life, you've been trying to get clean enough to go home. Bob simply nodded knotted tears running down his face. The parable of the prodigal son, familiar to actually both church and non-church people, often we assume that the word prodigal means lost. And the younger and the older son, each in their own way, seem lost. But actually, it comes from the Greek word meaning wastefully extravagant. And we often think of forgiveness meaning the pardon of a fault or showing pity or mercy, but indeed it comes from the Greek words most often translated to send away, to let go, to keep no longer. Forgiveness does not mean that the wrong doesn't matter. It means that we give up the need to deal with it. We're putting the wrong in God's hands and moving on. In the parable of the prodigal son, we have one son who has a difficult time receiving forgiveness and another son who has a very difficult time in giving forgiveness. Or maybe both have both difficulties. Does it sound familiar? Have you been in each difficult situation at some point in life, in the parable and in the movie, For those of you who have seen it, the Mr. Rogers movie, there are examples of being wastefully extravagant and also of sharing extravagant love and forgiveness. For those who have seen the film, Lloyd the journalist, who has shared conflict and separation with his father, questions Mr. Rogers. What do you mean, people like me? Broken people? And Mr. Rogers responds, I've never met anyone like you before, and I don't believe you are broken. I know you are a man of conviction, a person who knows the difference between what is wrong and what is right. Try to remember the relationship 
with your father also helped to shape those parts. He helped you to become who you are. In 1997, Fred Rogers won an Emmy for Lifetime Achievement. He was introduced as the best neighbor any of us have ever had, Mr. Rogers. Then he got up on the Emmy stage and he did a remarkable thing. Kind of risky, countercultural thing that just isn't done too much on TV. He asked for 10 seconds seconds of silence. In TV world, they call it dead air air time, and it's to be avoided, not embraced. But there he is, Mr. Rogers, the small man on this huge stage, surrounded by celebrities, many more known and popular than him, and he says, it's a beautiful night in this neighborhood. So many people have helped me come to this night. Some are here. Some are far away. Some are even in heaven. All of us have special ones who have loved us into being. Would you just take along with me 10 seconds to think of the people who helped you become who you are, those who have cared about you and wanted what was best for you in life? 10 seconds of silence. I'll watch the time. There was a chuckle in the crowd, and then, then there were tears. As the camera panned from face to face, tears, then people realized what was happening, and he continued, whomever you've been thinking about, how pleased they must be to know the difference they feel, you feel they've made. You know they're the type of people television does well to offer to our world, Special thanks to my family and friends and my co-workers in public broadcasting. No one is perfect. No one is a saint. We're such a mixture. Sometime this week, I invite you to read through the story of the prodigal son again and see what character in it resonates with you the most. Where for you do you experience extravagant love? Never, never can I read this parable or hear it read, as Tony did this morning, without thinking of the painting done so well of a father running, running down the road, robe flapping open, and only one shoe on, running to greet his son, whom he sees way, way down the road, to welcome him, no bath, to welcome him, to hug him, no bath, to put a robe on him, no bath, mentioned, but the poured out love flows over him. As the son is welcomed back home, And then, and then somewhere out of the artist's view, sits the older son, the older brother, disgusted, grumpy, upset at at how this one who flaunted everything is receiving such welcome. And he, the loyal one, the one who has never caused any trouble, who's done all the work, where's his reward? How could his father welcome this one back and throw a party? Such a parable of hospitality and extravagant love, even for those at times deemed unlovable, especially for those who need a bath and others who feel they never need a bath. Fred Rogers said, the underlying message of the neighborhood is that if somebody cares about you, if somebody cares about you, it's possible that you'll care about others. Hear that again. The underlying message of the neighborhood is that if somebody cares about you, it's possible that you'll care about others. You are special, 
and so is your neighbor. That part is essential, that you're not the only special person in the world. The person you happen to be with at the moment is loved, too. And then he went on to say one of his greatest lines, God in God's mercy accepts us exactly as we are. All of us have special ones who have loved us into being. Would you just take along with me 10 seconds to think of the people who have helped you become who you are, those who have cared about you and wanted what was best for you in life? Let's take 10 seconds of silence, and I'll watch the time. Give God thanks. Amen. As you leave today by the south doors, you will see a blue sheet of paper. You're welcome to take one if you would like. On it is kind of a belief statement that it was put together from the beautiful day in the neighborhood by the United Methodist Board of Discipleship. Let me read for you the last paragraph of it as our sending forth. We believe that beautiful days are not made by what we have, but by who we love. We believe in cultivating the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. We thank God 
for this beautiful day. Go forth and live in it with extravagant love. Thank you.